welcome everyone. We're just getting started. Um, while you wait, before we get started, if you just want to introduce yourself in the chat uh, by typing your first name and your last name, as well as where you're joining us from, uh, we're very uh, pleased to welcome you to uh, Solution Group 3, Adapting and Refining Cleft Care Protocols. I will begin shortly, but I'll just run through a couple of uh, participation uh, notes. Karen, if you could just go to the next slide. Thank you. Um, so how to participate in this round table, please keep your video switched on. Uh, we'd love to see your faces um, and we'll be muted just during this portion while our solution group presents. Um, but during that time, you're welcome to type questions and comments and engage that way or use the reactions button as Hugh just showed us in the plenary. Um, and you may signal that you'd like to speak during the discussion session uh, by raising your hand and please remember to unmute yourself um, that would be very helpful. Thank you. We can move to the next slide, Karen. Um, so as I said, this is roundtable A. If you found us, you're in the right place. I see more people joining us. Uh, you're welcome to please uh, turn on your video, uh, write your name in the chat and where you're joining us from. We're gonna get started shortly. I see uh, Matt and Michael have already uh, chimed in, um, but you're at Adapting and Refining Cleft Care Protocols. Um, and the question that we're really engaging with is now that the global community has a better understanding of how COVID-19 and variants are transmitted, how can, how can CLEF teams ensure that their protocols reflect the most up-to-date good practices? And uh, our solution group was led by co-chairs, uh, Matt Fell and Karen Goldschmied, who are here today and you'll hear from them shortly. Uh, I'm Rachel, I'll be your host today. If you have any technical questions, uh, please do message me in the chat. Um, and next I'll introduce our S solution group uh, three members. Uh, Karen, we can go to the next slide. And so our solution group members uh, for SG3 are Giant, Dr. Giant, who's on this call, Dr. Rui Pereira, Dr. Michael Goldwasser, and Dr. Christian Nawish. We're very thankful for their uh, discussion and participation over the last couple of weeks. And now I'll turn it back to Karen. Karen, sorry, we'll just unmute you. Karen, can you unmute yourself? We still can't hear you, Karen. Karen, can you unmute yourself? Sorry, there's just a bottom, um, a, a button at the bottom of the screen. Maybe un, maybe stop sharing your screen for a moment just so you can unmute yourself. You can see Zoom. There we go. We can see you and we can hear you, Karen. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, well, we are as group found and I don't know why it doesn't work now. I see, well. Sorry about that. First of all, we want as a group to say that we have no conflicts of interest in this um, group that we were discussing. Uh, we had a great challenge when we first read and, and watched and uh, suggested our title for presentation. And that was pro to provide solutions and recommendations for cleft care during COVID. And at the beginning, it was tough to try to figure out how we can uh, talk about it because it was a very unstable topic. But we had some advantages. We, we had advantages prior to 2020 when the pandemic first started, we had not knowledge and now we have a better understanding of what is COVID and lots of countries and uh, organizations they have made development uh, protocols for treating not only cleft, but other pathologies with this COVID pandemic. However, when we looked at literature, there is little scientific evidence regarding uh, cleft lip and palate. So we also shortly talked about our factors. Sometimes even prior to this pandemic, 
we have difference in local health care among us. Our social, economic, and cultural situation differs from country to country, and even in countries, we are different. There are countries that have a multidisciplinary team care approach, others they don't have it right now, or they have lack of resources. And some countries, they don't have even local teams on sites and are depending on external groups that come to visit and help them out. So prior to pandemic, there was a huge difference among us. So as you see, there are so many topics we can talk about it that we thought that maybe if we are focusing our priorities and principles for this talk in two mainly areas that was safety and secondly, surgery and comprehensive care, that we could come up with something to share with you and try to make a nice discussion afterwards. So I'm handling now uh, to Matt, who's going to introduce the first part of our talk. Great, thanks, Karen. Welcome, everybody. It's, it's lovely to see you all here. My name is Matt Fell. Please do post your comments and questions along the way. We'll, we'll be finished in about 20 minutes and then opening up for discussion. It's a, a great honor to introduce Dr. Michael Goldwasser, who's going to talk about our first focus area, which was safety, principles and priorities in safety. Over, over to you, Dr. Michael Goldwasser. Thank you very much, Matt. And uh, thank you, Karen and Rachel for putting this together. Uh, excellent topic. So my focus is on safety and what priorities we've taken. I work at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill, North Carolina in the United States. And I also consult and work on the Surgical Council for Operation SMILE. Over the past year, we've been fortunate under the direction of uh, Ruben Ayala at uh, Operation SMILE, as, as well as Ann Campbell and Gear Stanglin, to have put together an extensive program on what we thought were safety priorities in providing care in low and middle income countries. Our, our goal in the next slide was to first, Karen, thank you, was to make sure that we understood we were trying to avoid potential harm in any of our care teams. And, and this involved primarily our patients, our staff and the healthcare volunteers, uh, healthcare workers, as well as the volunteers who had previously traveled on international missions and programs to help care for these children. And as many of our programs are uh, written, we've tried to do things beginning when COVID became a reality. The next slide. So what lessons did we learn? And we've done this in the idea of a, a street sign or street light where you would have green to go, red for stop and yellow to proceed with caution. <clears throat> Before COVID, the green part, we often we had protocols that were in place and how we decided who to treat and when to treat them. We also had testing protocols, which I'll give you an overview of. And then we had to decide how could we start programs both locally and internationally again. Before COVID, we were obviously wide open treating as many case, many patients as we could, as did all the other international communities. And our priorities were pretty well established. But beginning in March of 2020, Operation Smile and most other international programs came to a grinding halt. And we did not proceed at all with any further care. All international programs were stopped. Virtually all local programs were stopped. As we've proceeded down the pathway, we've now gone into the yellow phase of proceeding with caution and how we've tried to develop certain protocols that would allow us <clears throat> to open up care again for our patients, also providing safety for our partners in care. Next slide. So before COVID, we did routinely for patients had just a CBC and probably bleeding studies. These were the only ones that we felt were necessary to carefully care for our patients. During COVID, if there were an emergency procedure, we still had to get a CBC and bleeding studies. And after COVID, our protocols will still be the same. But 
when we came to a hard stop, we also added in the test for COVID with the uh, real-time PCR antigen test. After COVID, we're still doing this as we're trying to restart care for patients, knowing that we need to know if they're positive. And these have to be obtained within the appropriate number of hours prior to surgery and anesthesia. <clears throat> also during and after COVID, we made decisions at Operation Smile for who do we test as far as ourselves, our staff, and all our volunteers. During COVID, we set up protocols that said you had to have testing if you were gonna participate in any of our programs. And after COVID, we decided to initiate the same types of testing, but we were making sure our healthcare workers were either vaccinated or had testing showing they were negative. The next slide. <clears throat> Also to provide safety for restarting our programs, we've made the efforts to make sure that certain things were, were available and we could count on these to provide safety. And this is including, do we have adequate uh, personal protective equipment? Do we have adequate supplies for hygiene? Do we have masks that are of the appropriate size for providing care? And, in high resource countries, we would certainly want N95 masks and we would want the same for everyone. Do we have access to testing? What is the vaccination status of the community as well as to the healthcare workers? Are we ability to care for, do we have the ability to care for any patients who do test positive or for any staff member? Do we have facilities available? And then clearly this all had to, to filter down to the next topic that we'll be discussing is when we decide what priorities are appropriate for us to care for, how do we position those as we restart programs? We also had to make sure if we were gonna have programs, do we have the ability to quarantine or isolate our staff and our patients if they become positive? And most critically for a lot of us is, do we have travel opportunities? And most of us were limited in what we were allowed to do and what countries we could visit uh, or care for patients and, uh, and still have the ability to return home. And if we tested positive after traveling to an international location, would we be able to return to our home communities? Uh, and that became an overriding problem as we enter into the summer of 2021. So how did we approach this? The next slide will comment on the fact we took a very, very conservative approach. We based everything we could on what evidence is available and it had to be international references, whether it's the CDC, the World Health Organization or the National Institute of Health or any of the other communities, there had to be international references that we could rely on to say, this is satisfactory, this meets our needs. And we had to confirm this with any refereed contemporary literature. We could not go to things that were published in, in literature that was not internationally accepted. And at Operation Smile, we made these decisions in order to uh, create a protocol that would allow us to open up our care both on a local level and on an international level. And for our results over the past year at Operation Smile, and the next slide will give you an overview, is that fortunately we had no morbidity or mortality associated with the COVID-19 uh, virus. All the programs we canceled in March, 20, in March of 2020, we are now exploring and have opened many local programs and are now exploring opportunities to open up some international programs based on a needs basis. And again, the medical, the medical leaders at Operation Smile took a very conservative and aggressive approach in making sure all our guidelines were followed this gave us the ability to completely shut down our programs and still allow us to then slowly reopen 
the floodgates to be able to care for all these patients and their families. We did have one program canceled this year because someone turned positive and spread to other people in the uh, group. And so the program was canceled. Any of the complications we had over the past year in our local groups, which we did have complications as any anesthesia surgery program will have, were from the actual surgery or from anesthesia. They were not attributed to any viral uh, spread. So we feel that while we unfortunately still have complications, we, they were not due to the uh, SARS virus. And we were able to have a very, very conservative yet aggressive approach in how to manage this problem. So that led us to the fact that we feel this was a good way to proceed. Our protocols were available to people and the countries that have been involved in, in Operation Small all at least followed the guidelines and are now willing to consider opening, reopening some of their care. And that will let us lead us into the next part of this conversation. Uh, and I'll return it to Matt to go into the surgical outlines and protocols we've developed. Dr. Goldwasser, thank you so much for explaining your well thought out considerations. Um, and, and this was our, our first focus area, the provision of safe care in our task to consider adaptions and refinements to the cleft care protocol. After we'd considered safety, we considered a second focus area and I'm going to introduce that now. This is principles and priorities in the cleft care protocol relating to surgery and comprehensive cleft care. Next slide, please, Karen. Now, it, it may strike you that any attempt to define priorities within the cleft care protocol may seem like a very controversial thing to do because we all know in this multi multidisciplinary specialty that each element is equally important. So why on earth did we, we, did we do it? Well, we're, we're aware that the COVID pandemic uh, has created a huge backlog of children who have, uh, who have got cleft and have been untreated. And on top of that, it's exacerbated shortages of resources, and these may include hospital spaces, surgical equipment and staff. So the reality in many places is that there's just too much work to do and too little time to do it. We thought, therefore, that there was a global need to prioritise urgent or time sensitive elements of the cleft care protocol and be able to support these difficult decisions with evidence to back them up so that policymakers were also persuaded of their importance so that they could facilitate their delivery. So our aim in this part was to reach a consensus amongst us on the different aspects of cleft care protocol that we thought should be prioritized. And to help us, we looked for guidance, uh, which we found um, in the countries that we worked with at a national level, and also international guidance that's been published. And we also looked to the literature to see um, outcome-based evidence that we could use. So I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Rui Pereira from uh, Brazil to take us through the results of, uh, of what, what, what our findings were. Okay, thank you, Matt. I'm trying to, uh, to show you what we have done during this weeks and these meetings uh, about this problem. The main question posed on this group is how to deal with the untreated cleft patients in order to get them safe and rehabilitated on and after this pandemic. Present group consensus, it's how on how adapting the cleft protocols with an emphasis on how to deliver outcome-based and comprehensive care. At this time of health and social storm, we have built a consensus based on different realities and comprehensive experience of our members. 
trying to find out a common pathway. It wasn't easy. And searching for an evidence-based inquiry, it's an opportunity rather difficult to find papers and researchers. Next, please. The principles that guide us uh, in this inquiry is one, important to recognize most evidence is low level and controversial areas exist within the protocol such as optimal timing of pallet repair and use, for example, of NAM. So we cannot be prescriptive. We can reach consensus to prioritize certain aspects of the protocol over others. We can advocate adapting the protocol to minimize hospital visits, hospital stays, enabling elements to be delivered remotely or in the ambulatory setting, if it's possible and safe. Next, please. No, sorry. In this slide, we can find our proposal of a stage re resumption. We highlight here the life-saving priority on dealing with resp respiratory distress in Pierre Robin sequence. The nutrition difficulty in these patients, it must be considered a top priority when retaking surgeries as well cleft palate repair. We establish it as medium priorities, primary lip repairs, alveolar bone grafts, and PPI repairs procedures, as we feel this can improve a better commitment to treatment. Next, please. In access to comprehensive cleft care, we highlight here the newborn cleft assessment that must be offered to all patients and caregivers, especially on breathing, nutrition, and hearing. To be aware of ear and dental infections, it's another important item to be observed on these patients. Speech assessment using telehealth technology, it's an important resource to be explored more and more. I'm done. Thank you so much. And now I want to tell you a little bit about our experience in Chile. This is a South American country. And when I tried to summarize our, our experience in, in this pandemic, I felt it was a little bit like what we have talked in theory. So at the beginning of the pandemic, in our most critical period of time, everything was shut down. There were no elective surgeries, no on-site assessment, no clinical assessment for our children. And most of the things that we can uh, achieve was making follow-up of our patients via telemedicine and uh, that kind of care. But then as we knew how COVID was behaving and what tools we had to gather in order to make a safety um, access to our patients and ourselves. And as we knew that the cases are beginning to drop, we restarted elective surgeries, but on healthy patients without concomitant morbidities. And we did prioritize first primary cleft surgeries and we started to make on-site assessments and also a mixture because we are still now treating and making follow-up via telemedicine in some patients. To make um, a healthy environment and secure environment, our nurse uh, did always till now, obviously, a questionnaire over the phone to figure out if this child or the family actually had some symptoms that were supposed to alarm us and to send that child to a PCR or to uh, a, another health system to uh, discard if he had COVID. 
all of our patients that are inpatients and are patients who are arriving of our surgical ward, they had to undergo uh, COVID PCR at least 24 to 48 hours before surgery. And in our in and out patients, we always ask them that if they have a slight doubt of symptoms they don't have and they cannot come to our hospital, we promote social distancing, mouth cover all times, and hand sanitizing systems are available through all our hospital setting. And down you can see the, the social distances in the waiting area, the hand sanitizing products that we can provide to ourselves and our patients, and the questionnaire from our nurse. And very shortly, it's just answers yes or no. Do you have fever? Do you have cough? And, and with that questionnaire, she is able to say, please don't come in or please go ahead and come to our hospital. And regarding to our more surgical procedures, we are a teaching pediatric hospital. So a little bit above of COVID because we don't receive COVID patients in our hospital. So that's a huge um, positive things for us because we can go on. But we, we have restricted circulation now in our hospital for patients and for students and for um, staff. Uh, our medical staff, they have to make sure the surgical times. And this makes difficult as we are teaching a uh, hospital to keep teaching because they have to be faster and quicker in their outcomes. And they all have their personal equipment for uh, protection. And as we, as I said, stated, there, I put there a little um, uh, short abstract of the British Journal. Uh, our medical team, they did this little study to see how we can keep teaching our students in surgical um, uh, access. And this was published. And if you want to have a further look on this, you can search it and read it. But it says how, you, how we still can provide also teaching even during COVID. So this is one of our main entrances from the hospital. Uh, and I wanted to, to see if we had numbers that I can provide to you. And yes, during 2020, we did still surgeries in cleft and a total of 113, 71 of those were primary surgery and 42 were secondary surgery. We did have two PCR positive children after discharge. Um, but then when we looked and we, we set the alarm, there was no traceability from the patients that were in the same ward of that child or professionals. So we believe this was out of the hospitals once re released that COVID affected that family. So now I will head it to Matt to make our final summary, Matt. Karen, thank you. You just brought it to life and uh, described beautifully what it's what it's like in in Chile and the, and the challenges there. I'm I'm going to summarise uh, our, our our group's presentation uh, before we we open up for discussion here. So, in Solutions Group Three, a, a couple of months ago, we were charged with the challenge of of considering uh, adaptions and refinements to the cleft care protocol in COVID. And we were asked to provide tangible solutions today. Now, out of necessity, we had to narrow down because this is a, an enormous topic. And so we, we chose two focus areas to tell you about. Safety, that was first. And this is surely the foundation on which any, any kind of comprehensive care should be delivered. Um, we have benefited from Dr. Goldwasser's experience of, of the Operation Smile uh, guidance that, that he's created, and uh, he, he's really got into some of those considerations there. Only then could we go on to uh, the priorities of the cleft care protocol itself. And really, it was quite amazing that given the diversity of our specialties, of where we're based around the world, uh, we actually could reach a consensus 
and, and prioritize certain time critical uh, elements of the, of the cleft care protocol. And we've uh, put that in a, a traffic light um, table to, to convey that uh, to you today. So we've heard from Karen in, in, in Chile, you know, the, the pandemic continues to wreak havoc around the globe. Uh, so it, it couldn't be more relevant for us all to be here that we come together and, and discuss this difficult, difficult topic so we can continue to uh, help children with cleft to get the comprehensive care that they need. We're, we're going to open up now and, and, uh, and hear your, your thoughts and, and, and comments. Thank you so much for coming to, to join us. Um, I think that uh, that's very kind, uh, Dr. McConnell. Thank you for your for your kind comment. Uh, if anyone would would like to make a, a comment, please do just unmute yourself or or, or, or raise your hand. But um, just to start us off, I wonder if I can ask Dr. Jayanth to uh, give us his his perspective. Uh, Dr. Jayanth was uh, one of our solutions group members and based in India, as I'm sure some of our other attendees today from India will, will testify, it's, it's been quite a challenging time over the last couple of weeks. Um, could you put us into the picture, uh, Dr. Jayanth, about what the reality is, I guess, for your cleft patients and, and the protocol and care you're able to deliver at this this moment, what's your reality? Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to one and all. Uh, uh, as of now, we are going through the second uh, wave of COVID in India, which has been quite severe than compared to the first wave. And we have come to terms with the pandemic. Uh, most of our centers in India have been providing the online facility for consultation and uh, an in-person uh, first-time consultation for any newborn, be it uh, the overall health assessment and ruling out uh, the syndromes, uh, also looking after the nutrition, the feeding assessments, and uh, as we uh, put up in the presentation, any uh, uh, child with a PRS syndrome, we are trying to tackle it as per the respiratory uh, assessment of the case. Um, uh, our comprehensive care programs are uh, more or less uh, uh, going on online, and that is to do mainly with the speech uh, therapy part of it. However, uh, uh, the, uh, the other components of the comprehensive care, mainly the dentistry, the ortho, they're all restricted at this point in time. And uh, uh, most of the primary and secondary uh, surgeries are put on hold during this uh, peak of the pandemic as uh, we don't have any beds in the hospitals. And we uh, are going to resume soon. And we have been in touch. Most of us have been in touch with our patients. Patients do call us, uh, especially the newborn uh, families uh, tend to lean on us for all the COVID appropriate uh, behaviors and also to learn more about the symptoms. There are many families who have been affected by COVID and they have reached out to us just to ensure that the child is not affected by COVID. There have been a couple of them uh, who got admitted in my own setup, the small kids, uh, 45 days and uh, less than three months, uh, they did well, they did recover and uh, we have helped them out. So, so far, uh, the pandemic, uh, during the pandemic, we have been delivering uh, as much of uh, uh, attention and care that we can render uh, through online consultation and online assessment and examination, and only emergencies are being attended to. Once uh, we are behind the wave, uh, we want to open up for the primary cases, and uh, in three months' time, we hope to start the secondary procedures too. Thank you, Matt. Well, 
certainly amazing challenges, but some encouragement as well. And amazing to hear that the the cleft patients are leaning on you for for COVID advice. That's that's something that uh, you might not 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 consider at first. So that that's fascinating. Thank you so much for that. Uh, welcome all of your comments and um, and, and questions. C can I just ask uh, Dr. Michael Goldwasser a question after his his presentation to us? You, you said that the the local programs have have opened up first, uh, which I guess makes sense because the international uh, programs are not are not going to be uh, able to. But but is this going to change the uh, the the balance of, of of how many local pro programs there are, and is it is it going to encourage the local programs to expand? Do you think as as uh, as perhaps a positive of 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 COVID? Uh, yes, I absolutely feel that our programs at Operation Smile, and probably for many others who are internationally uh, convening, will change dramatically to more local programs and, and part of our outreach process is to help train surgeons uh, locally so that can continue the care. It's uh, the, you know, a surgeon in the village is the classic text that was written a few years ago about neurosurgery in, in Africa and, and how you train local people to proceed and, and be able to complete care and try to, and make it at the same quality that you would expect from anyone treating someone in your family. Uh, I think that the programs that David Chung has initiated at Operation Smile and the educational roles to try to get surgeons involved in, in uh, outreach programs to, to be able to acquire the skills necessary on a local level. <clears throat> and clearly we've got that in place in Operation Smile now but it's gonna to have to expand. And in reality, we're really working ourselves out of opportunities and jobs in the future. And which is a good thing, you know, we'd like to be able to have all the local care provided and certainly local follow-up. Uh, those of us who have done it for many, many years continue to enjoy the experience of having an international group of colleagues that we can learn from and share experiences and improve the quality of care, as is the goal of your program here uh, at the uh, at S4. You know, we clearly are trying to improve international care and get us all at the same benchmarks. Uh, Operation Smile will clearly see, I think, a, dra a dramatic reduction. And our initial foray, which is uh, just becoming published now, is that we will have people participate in international missions on an as needed basis. So if a pediatric anesthesiologist is required in uh, Ecuador, we will have somebody that is qualified to travel internationally and is able to go and the safety things are in place, we can have that person recruited for an international mission. Or if uh, a surgeon particularly gifted in fistula repairs like Dr. Gulam Fayez uh, would be able to travel uh, in safety from his location in, in Lahore, Pakistan to be able to uh, head to a place in Egypt to help surgeons there. They're already excellent surgeons, but you get the needs basis of the most qualified person that you can find to help uh, improve the care. So I do see there'll be many more local missions, but the uh, initial forays in international care will be on a needs basis on what players are needed, whether it's uh, special speech language pathologists or surgeons or anesthesia personnel. Wow, that, I mean, that is quite Good a fundamental on. change. That's really interesting. Yeah, D Dr. Manu. Good evening, yes. uh, good evening all. I just wanted to know uh, from the experience of the round table that anybody had an experience uh, that uh, after admission, that the patient is scheduled for surgery or any treatment, that the patient has developed COVID on a routine checkup. So this implicates uh, a lot of uh, influence on child because there's a treatment delay, there is a financial thing, there is a psychosocial thing that COVID has come. And then it, is, it affects a lot, uh, the patient and the parent. 
So how uh, you have dealt with the situation where you need to counsel the patient for to come after, let's say, a lot of months because they have traveled a lot during this situation itself is a risk. Uh, so a lot of things happens in the patient's mind. So did anybody had an uh, experience like that or do you want to comment on this uh, part? How, how you change your protocol accordingly? Any Anybody? That's an excellent question. Uh, in, in, in my centre in the UK, we, 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 we haven't had that. that. Um, Rui or um, Karen or uh, Michael or Jayanth, have you, have you experienced that situation? As I said, in, in our uh, one and, and a little bit more month of COVID treatment and still ongoing uh, surgeries, we had two cases with positive outcome after release from hospital. And our protocol was to get back to those children who were in the same ward and to those professionals that attended that particular child. And so far, none of that group had COVID. So our assumption was that this child had the, the, the exposure to the virus after release, not in the hospital. But even though we had to, to go back to those who were next to the child for precaution and make for those other group a follow-up. But so far, everybody was negative as well. And those with positive that we have prior to surgery, well, those children, they, they, they are delayed from surgery till uh, we make follow-up and then to, to promote a next surgery date within a, a secure time of period after COVID uh, disease. Matt, would you be able to comment, or uh, Rui or Jayanth, uh, on the implications of vaccinations now being in the United States from 12 years and older? And then how do you expect things to change if we can start immunizing children six months to 12 years? It's not available everywhere yet, but what would be your thoughts? Well, I believe that this, this is a, a very important uh, option to vac vaccinate uh, patients under 12 years old. But here in Brazil, we have a, a huge problem because we have no vaccines for adults or old people. So uh, we are far from it, that point and probably in next year we'll deal with that but I think it's a very good idea. In, in my opinion, it would be a game changer if we could vaccinate the small children, but we are far from uh, realizing that dream, I would say, since uh, uh, none of the professional bodies have started doing a trial on small kids as of today. Um, they have just... Uh, begin trials in few countries, but I, I doubt if European Union or the American countries have approved it for uh, even the trial in small young kids. Uh, it's, a, it's a very welcome thing that uh, the vaccine is approved for 12 plus age group. And I, I feel it would take at least a couple of years before uh, kids get to be vaccinated in the lower income countries. So uh, till then, uh, perhaps this could be challenging. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the efficacy in children is one thing, but the efficacy in adults is yet to be known, isn't it? Because in, in the UK, we're, we're currently a bit of a, a, a national experiment. We've, we're very proud of our, our vaccine rollout. It's very high, but we're, our cases are now going going up. So we're just about to see whether our hospital cases follow that. So it's going to be a, a very telling um, couple of couple of weeks uh, for, the, for how effective those vaccines are. Now, we've had a lovely comment um, from um, uh, Adiola from Nigeria. I, I don't know whether your um, bandwidth is, is sufficient. Are you still with us? Um, in fact, I'm not sure that they, they are. 
tell, telling us about their um, experience in, in Nigeria. Um, I realised that we didn't really address Dr. Manu's um, uh, concern about having a, a a patient diagnosed with with COVID during the uh, their, their cleft treatment, and I think Dr. Manu is not with us here any any anymore either. But yes, Dr. Jayanth. Uh, Matt, uh, uh, I, I have just had an experience of it's of two children getting admitted prior to their primary surgeries. Both the kids have had very mild uh, symptoms, and they got discharged. Uh, in a very predictable manner on the 10th day and they are doing fine. So far, there's been no impact on their uh, uh, psychosocial or uh, financial uh, levels concerning the child and the family. Well, that's very good to hear. Thank you for that. Uh, Dr. McConnell, you, you, you're joining us from um, Ethiopia and um, we, we we haven't heard an, an awful lot in this um, group from from the uh, the African continent. Uh, well, uh, apart from um, yeah, uh, would you be able to just give us a, a bit of an insight of of uh, how you're rolling out your cleft cleft protocol at the moment and what you're dealing with? I think you're on uh, mute, Dr. McConnell. Sorry, thank you very much. It was uh, really interesting to hear what uh, work uh, is going on all over the world. Uh, first, obviously, at uh, as many places, uh, we are in lockdown, but now we opened. Uh, so since uh, April 2021, we have opened, and uh, the protocol we are following here is uh, every patient should be screened before admission. So we screen before admission, we try to isolate uh, the family uh, with the child uh, and then admit him. Uh, even in such a circumstance, we have uh, a patient who was admitted and became symptomatic. And when he is retested, he became positive and discharged. But luckily the symptoms were smooth and the parents were not uh, really uh, in a serious condition. Uh, this is a protocol we follow now, currently. We don't admit uh, before uh, Clef's child uh, became negative. And are you having to prioritize certain procedures and, and certain elements of the, of the comprehensive care package, or are you able to, to deliver the, 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 full, the full package to, to your patients? Uh, we have a, a backlog now, but because of that, we the the protocol you follow, uh, priority, low priority, uh, that we are trying to follow because uh, well, I think Matt, you know, we have a lot of adults, unoperated adults. Uh, it's, it's become down now, but still we have a lot of unoperated adults. We try to give priority for pallets, obviously. And uh, some of the surgeries we don't do, like orthognathic surgery, we have not yet started. Uh, but our priority is uh, pallet uh, and then uh, go down. And Dr. McConnell, hi, this is Karen from South America. In terms of com comprehensive cleft care, do you have a, a team like speech language therapists who is attending via telemedicine or is it on site? How do you deal with the other aspects of the treatment? getting out of surgery? Uh, yeah, we have a comprehensive cleft care uh, at our unit. Uh, actually, it is the only uh, municipal cleft care center. Uh, when we are in lockdown, uh, we use telephone. Uh, telemedicine is not accessible here. So we, we use phone call. Uh, like uh, we give instructions through a phone call, what to do to the parents, and then through a phone, the speech therapists will, will hear the, how the child is doing, like uh, asking to sell to some, say few words, and then assess, and then instruct the parents what to do. So our main tool during the lockdown was uh, uh, telephone. 
uh, landline or mobile. This is concerning speed therapy. The same thing with uh, orthodontics care. Uh, we use a uh, telephone. First, we give instruction, like taking pictures, follow up pictures, uh, and then, like for example, tightening. I think uh, our orthodontics is attending these conferences in one of the groups. He can comment. So, like, uh, tighten the, the arch, or if there is any broken arch, report, come back, uh, and then on oral hygiene. Uh, some uh, on a lower scale, uh, we try to cope uh, this way during the lockdown. But now we have started uh, full activity. Uh, of course, we use uh, when it's available PPE, uh, like uh, face shield. Uh, Google, uh, uh, that was a, a telephone during the lockdown, even now, our only tool is telephone. Okay, thank you. Yeah. There is one question from Dr. Michael Goldwasser to me on speech, the implications from returning to program. Michael, I felt that it was more difficult more than returning to keep the program ongoing. So speech language, it's easy to, to keep over the phone or over telemedicine. Um, but then again, as you stated in, 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 your, in, in your talk, when, when you know the patients, when you have local teams that know the patients, it's easier to make telemedicine or non-insight clinical evaluation because you know the patient already. The problem for starting and returning to the program via telemedicine is for the new patients because I don't know them. I don't know the family. So an oral examination or, or even a speech examination, it's more difficult via telemedicine or not inside. And again, as surgeons, we also need our personal, um, uh, personal protection um, uh, tools that we have, not every hospital, but we do. And we prioritize as in surgery, our children that needed to be seen inside, for example, nasoendoscopies. And even those we prioritize probably in 2019, I would suggest to my ENT, oh, let's do a nasoendoscopy in this child. And in these days, I think twice before sending a child to an endoscopy, I also have to prioritize which child really needs uh, because of all the safety that's involving. And I think that is, you have to know your patients. It's easier when you follow up your patients and you have local teams working on them to keep going speech. And some children, you have to see them face to face and with your protections. You, Karen. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't know whether Dr. Giselle um, De Silva Dalbin is 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 able to uh, to chip in and uh, whether her bandwidth is 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 sufficient. But it'd be lovely to hear from her from Brazil, um, particularly because hi, welcome. It's lovely to, lovely to see you. Now now I, I particularly like to hear from you. It, you know, <laughs> No, no, no worries. When we were trying to prioritize, hi. hi, lovely to see you. When we were Can trying, you hear me? Perfectly, perfectly. Yeah. Well, when we were trying to prioritize, we 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 put routine dental procedures as a lower priority, but um, uh, infections in and around the mouth as as a as a urgent priority. Now it'd be interesting because we didn't have a, a dentist on our on our panel. Is that an out? Is that an, a bit of an outrage to you? And would you um, say that we're wrong? Or what, what's your experience been in? Well, uh, in our center, we have a particularity that we 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 began. We were established inside the dental school. And then we became an independent hospital. And so dental service is a very high priority in our hospital. And we don't allow children with dental caries to undergo any surgery in the oral cavity. And so either lip repair, dental repair, even tonsillectomy, 
we do screening, pre-open screening of children. And if they have dental caries, they are not allowed to undergo surgery. This became a little bit more complicated after the COVID-19 pandemic because several dental services are not working, especially public uh, services outside uh, of our city. And we receive patients from all over the country. And we notice a slight increase in the prevalence of dental caries because I think uh, the patients are, especially children, are spending more time inside their homes. And so they're having more access to sugary foods. And uh, we have uh, a relatively high uh, prevalence of caries here. But in my center, we do have a full dental team. And so I, I cannot tell you what happens if a person with a heavy decay undergoes surgery, because in our setting, this is not allowed. Is, was that the question? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's, that's fascinating to hear. I, 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 are, you, um, are you doing a lower volume of, of work uh, dentally at the moment? And, and it sounds as if you're gonna have a higher volume with all of those caries afterwards, but- yeah. I, are you able to to get through volume at the moment or is it just not possible less than before we have four in uh, i will talk about my clinic that is pediatric dentistry we have four dental chairs but because of the distance between chairs we are currently working with only two chairs and we used to uh, assist a patient per hour and now because of our results, we need to have a little break between, and, and there should be one patient at every two hours, but uh, we have the other side of the situation because our patients travel days, sometimes uh, to, to arrive to our center. And so unfortunately, we're not able to follow this break between patients as much as we should because we had to cut the chairs into half and the hours would be also into half, but in practice, instead of uh, having two children per chair per period, we are having three or four because we need to make them ready for, for surgery. But that's the main problem that we are facing because it's very difficult to do dental work without our cells. And that, that has been our greatest problem. And in our center, we had reduced the load of surgeries because we are testing all patients that undergo surgery with PCR. We are lucky to have a PCR inside the campus. And so they do testing uh, the day before surgery. And uh, if they are positive, they will not undergo surgery. But uh, we are now, uh, we have just uh, increased the number of surgeries. Now uh, we were assisting 84. 86 surgeries per week and it was increased to 106 since last week and so it's about 20 25 surgeries a day but it has been a real problem for us indeed so it's, it's really going to become apparent um all of this over the next couple of months isn't it yeah Thank you so much for for describing that that that's that's really interesting to 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 get an insight um, we, we, we're starting to draw to a, a close of our allotted time here, so we'll just start uh, wrapping up in a minute. D just because you mentioned those numbers at the end, uh, Karen, you, you showed us your, your numbers of, of, of cases, which was, was interesting to see what had been possible in your centre um, over the last year. Can you give us a, a comparison of what, what that is like usually, or um, do you not have that at your fingertips? Is that a big drop, do you think? I have to unmute myself. It has, it has, but I, I give only the numbers for cleft related patients. What has dramatically dropped is the other plastic surgeries like hands, ears, with uh, other craniofacial patients. Those are almost to zero now. And because also of the comorbidities of syndromic patients. But um, if we compare the numbers of cleft, only cleft healthy patients, they're similar to 2019 and, and, and 18. But what has dropped very, very hard is the other 
part of the game like um, uh, um, ear jobs uh, for for Treacher Collins or, or Golden Heart patients, uh, maxillofacial surgery, big surgeries in those children. So those are almost very, very low now in these days. And what I have felt as speech and language therapy and I'm concerned is that the numbers, the ages, they have been uh, uh, not dramatically, but they're towards the one year of age for closing uh, palate rather than lowering the age for, to eight or nine months that we had prior to uh, pandemic. So now the children, they are older. And, and that will be a big impact further in the future for speech and language outcomes, because we know that that is already written and studied, that you have higher incidence of speech problems if you make surgery uh, above the one year of age. So that we have to research and keep an eye of those children. Yes, um, absolutely. And, tr and trying to untangle those uh, outcome results, uh, given the fact that people have been home, they haven't been communicating as, as normal, and they've had a later palate repair. It's going to be so complex trying to, to figure out what the actual impact of this, this pandemic has been. Um, Hugh, welcome. Uh, you, you had your hand up. Thank you. Yes. Um, my question, I guess, more to the, to the panel, anyone who's been studying this for the last few months, um, so we've heard, you know, there, there are some positive situations. Dr. Giselle is talking a little bit about, you know, an increasing in surgery. But for those of us who, you know, who have colleagues who are in situations where they might not be able to, to, to see anybody for the foreseeable future. You know, I know, I know many of these protocols were saying, oh, just for this period, you know, but if it's sort of an indefinite wave that's going in somewhere like Peru, you know, what protocols come to mind for you as being the most difficult to maintain if we're in a situation where there really doesn't seem to be a lot of hope of, of improvement in, in any kind of time frame that we can think of right now? Was your question related to surgery or to comprehensive life care overall? Yeah, I think it's whatever jumps out for anyone who's been thinking about these issues. Um, you know, I think all of us, you know, have had different moments of, of assuming that, oh, well, this is just to get us through this hump. Uh, but I think we've seen in some contexts where that hump is just continuing to, the, the guideposts continue to extend. And then we even heard, you know, even Uganda today, I mean, where they've been avoiding a lot of really intense restrictions. It now looks like they might be going to a period where they might not see a way forward. So I'm just thinking more about our colleagues in contexts where, where it doesn't seem more temporary. It seems more like something that needs to be addressed for the foreseeable future. For any one of you, what sticks out as some of those protocols that would be most difficult to maintain or that would have to be revisited uh, if you're really not able to see patients at all uh, or you can't plan, about, plan on that? I, I would comment, uh, Hugh, just as a quick response that I think some of the testing protocols that we've implemented with the uh, testing for, you know, for SARS-2, I'm not sure that will proceed in the future, just like we don't test for many viruses at all. We just go on their health and wellness checkup when they come in and are evaluated by anesthesia and pediatrics and, and nursing and a preoperative evaluation. I think that will drop off the radar but it may not be for two years until we get more herd immunity. But even in areas where uh, you know, other illnesses are widespread, we still don't test for those. We don't test for, uh, you know, for a, a variety of viral illnesses because as long as the kid looks well and appears well, the, and anesthesia and nursing and surgery feels are safe and pediatrics feel they're safe, to undergo an anesthetic and subsequent surgery, you proceed. So whether it's chikungunya or whether it's some other, yeah, some other viral illnesses, those will just go away. We'll probably go back to a green light, but vaccinations worldwide are still not available for a lot of communicable diseases, but we deal with them on an as needed basis. And whether we take prophylactic antibiotics for traveling to areas that are high risk for certain illnesses, we will continue to probably do that if we're from a high resource country 
traveling to a low resource country yeah, that has a preponderance of uh, certain illnesses and diseases. I'm hoping the green light will come on within two years. I'm hoping that countries that have excess capabilities for providing vaccinations will see fit to help the countries that have less resources so that physicians and nurses and healthcare workers and frontline workers and families and patients will all be able to get this. And within two years, I truly believe, as I think uh, Rui and commented earlier, is that we will have vaccinations for small children. And I know this week, actually on Thursday, I have, uh, Friday, I have 400 uh, children scheduled for, that are aged between ages 12 and 16 scheduled for vaccinations, 400 children at the local health center, so through their school. So I'm hoping that that will continue. Those resources are not available most places in the world. So I'm hoping we see that. And as a comment about the dental problems, which I think Giselle beautifully described, uh, acute problems and acute infections are dealt with immediately. And the more chronic dental caries problems can be dealt with as she's discussed. It just takes longer to do it, but her protocol is just perfect. So thank you, Giselle. Thank you for those thoughts. Uh, I believe, uh, just one moment, about two, two points that Michael talked about immunization with vaccines uh, in children. But another item to, to be considered is about the pregnant women that are being vaccinated, for example, here in Brazil. And we'll already find out that some children born after vaccination become immunocompetent. They have immunization to COVID-19. And the other thing, we must think about uh, a task force after, uh, after this crisis, because some countries, and I believe that we are not so lucky as Giselle in Bauru. Uh, for example, we have more than 500 patients waiting for, for surgery. And the priorities here, uh, it's the COVID and afterwards the other things. So we have no beds, we have no rooms, room for the cleft patients. We must wait and then do a, a, a strong effort to uh, deal with this waiting list. I believe that it's not only happening in Brazil, but also in, all around the world especially in low and middle uh, income uh, countries. Yeah. Um, yes, Dr. Can I, just, can I ask the qu yeah. uh, panel uh, a question with respect to urgency? Do you think that we should look at a different definition of urgency now at this point in time in the pandemic versus at the beginning? particularly something like cleft palate or even cleft lip repair that perhaps did not fit the urgency list before, but now they are very time sensitive and we need to inform our colleagues and our hospitals and our institutions that these are now urgent cases and we cannot wait to put these kids on the wait list for lips, palates, alveolar bone grafts, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great comment. Uh, we, we, we're starting to run out of time, but um, I, can I just tell you what happened in, in the UK? Because we had a, a prioritization system of all surgical procedures. And initially at the start of the pandemic in March, 2020, all cleft operations were way down, uh, including primary palate and uh, speech um, uh, procedures. And they were recategorized in the last couple of months to reflect that time sensitivity, that crucial element of uh, the fact that outcomes will be compromised if they don't get done in a timely manner. So I, I completely agree, Dr. Zucker. I think it, it, it is time to reevaluate, and we have to persuade um, the, the policymakers of the importance of this because 
lots of other specialties will be knocking on those doors and trying to persuade them that, that their cases are, are important. And, and so it really isn't, it, we have to have the evidence to back us up and, and, and the conviction. So, um, just, oh yes, Dr. McConnell. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry, just a few comments. The problem uh, I think is uh, many things are still unknown about COVID. The issue Dr. Michael mentioned about herd immunity uh, those people who are uh, infected are getting reinfection. So I'm not sure if we can hope on herd immunity. That's one very important issue. Uh, I think we have to push on what WHO in May uh, 2020 suggested that uh, get coming together, sharing resources uh, and so on. So this conference is, uh, I think I consider as part of that. Uh, coming together, sharing knowledge, experience, like the protocol you developed uh, is really excellent. So uh, I think since many things are not clear to me about COVID, uh, we have to look for uh, better and better solutions. We have, I, I don't think we have a better pollution until now because many of those people, even medical pro professionals in low and middle income countries they are struggling to get vaccine. They are not vaccinated, uh, leave alone the community. So it is really a huge problem to tackle in the future. Thank you, Dr. McConnell, and, uh, and thank you to everyone for, for, for joining us today. You've really ex expanded the discussion that we've been having over the last couple of months. You've brought in your, your experiences um, and, uh, and all of your, your knowledge, and we're, we're very grateful um, for that. I'm going to hand over to, uh, to Rachel now to tell us where we need to go and what we need to do. Um, but from all of us in, uh, in Solutions Group 3, we're, we're very grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. We're also so grateful uh, to the members of Solution Group 3, uh, Karen and Matt, Karen Goldschmidt and Matt Fell uh, for acting as co-chairs over these last weeks. Thank you so much for your leadership. As well, thank you to our valued members, Dr. Michael Goldwasser, Dr. Giant, uh, Dr. Rui Pereira, and also thank you to Dr. Christian Nowish. Um, thank you as well to the sponsors of the Circle of CLEF Professionals for making our work together possible uh, through this virtual conference. And thank you also for your discussions, your comments, your questions uh, were helpful as we work towards documenting our findings um, over the next weeks. Mm -hmm.